I want to talk about the Halo TV show for a bit, since I finally got around to actually watching. But before I talk about it, listen. I'm really tired of subscription services. The Days of Cable are back with a vengeance, but this time with a lot more unearned pride. You've got Disney+, Plus, HBO Max, Paramount+, Plus, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Peacock, Apple TV+, Plus, and so on. There's so much pointless junk on these streaming services. I'm convinced some of them aren't even real. Like, if I were to click on one of these fake shows out of curiosity, I'd just get a video of a person apologizing to me because they assumed no one would actually click. Then this person would direct me towards real shows like Breaking Bad. Paramount Plus is the latest money drain that I've had to subscribe to for only one thing, and it has ads regardless of your membership tier, a clunky menu, and the default subtitles were small, black, Times New Roman font. There was no way to change them in the app, and what I found out later was that in order to fix them, I'd need to open up my Xbox's settings outside of the app. But even then, the people on the Paramount Plus subreddit couldn't seem to agree if this worked or not. I hate all of these subscription services, and completely empathize with the older generation that ranted and raved about how annoying cable got. Thankfully, I am able to afford a lot of these stupid subscription services in no small part thanks to today's sponsor. This video is brought to you by Infinite Galaxy. What is Infinite Galaxy, you may ask? Why, it's only one of the most robust mobile sci-fi experiences out there. It's up to you to expand into the galaxy by upgrading your home base, exploring and reading about our solar system, strengthening your fleet and expanding your crew via the game's in-depth RPG systems. And then, only once you are prepared, push into enemy territory with the game's engaging PvP fleet battles. But wait, that's not all, because it will also be up to you to take to the stars in the game's ace strike missions, piloting your own starship and engaging in spaceflight PvE battles with dazzling visual effects and skyboxes. Use the link in the description below to download Infinite Galaxy and get access to $60 worth of in-game gifts for supporting the channel. Get out there, there's a galaxy to explore, and a thank you to Infinite Galaxy for sponsoring the video. Prior to the release of the show, they were very transparent about it being a different universe from the games, and I completely understand why some aren't happy with that choice. The primary universe of Halo is so vast that you could tell any kind of story in it. The reason I'm okay though with the show not being canon is because I grew up with things like Transformers, Marvel Comics, and so on, so I'm very used to the idea of telling new stories with new versions of old characters. Hell, to this day, I couldn't tell you if I prefer G1 Optimus Prime or Cybertron Optimus Prime. Same character, different incarnations. When watching the Halo TV show, I knew that they had this ambition to sort of have it be on the same level of Game of Thrones, with the universe's politics driving much of the interpersonal drama for the characters. So I was keeping my eyes peeled for changes that they could maybe use to squeeze some dramatic storylines out of. So, okay, in the world of the Halo show, Spartans are sort of like Robocop, their memories are deliberately suppressed and their biological processes are constantly monitored to make sure they're carrying out their orders. In the games, the UNSC are usually portrayed as good guys due to the games primarily focusing on Master Chief saving humanity from alien threats. In the show, it explores the more authoritarian aspects of the UNSC from the books and greater lore. Along the outskirts of the UNSC, colony worlds are trying to become their own independent states. What makes a Spartan so valuable to the UNSC as a way to suppress and squash rebellion is due to the brainwashing. Spartans never question their orders, or seriously ever consider the morality of what the UNSC is making them do. So, it's on one of these outer colony worlds where the Covenant attack in a shockingly violent raid on a village that happened to be close to a Covenant dig site. This settlement wasn't prepared for the Covenant because they thought the stories of them were just lies by the UNSC to get them to comply. It's weird to see Halo so violent again after the game franchise has been unfortunately softened up in recent years, but it sold the brutality of the Covenant well in this show. I just wish the Elites weren't so, well, troll-like. This was probably done to make them seem less rational and reasonable and a bit more monstrous, like something you couldn't reason with. But I can't say I'm a fan of this choice. They just look... Well, not like elites to me. But it's not gonna ruin the show. Their faces look pretty cool, though. Just when all hope seemed lost, a team of Spartans led by the Master Chief land and begin kicking some serious butt, and I really enjoyed this. 
I saw people clowning on the CGI, and it's definitely funny seeing a rubbery looking Master Chief flying around before transitioning to an actual actor in a costume, but I felt that the action was edited well enough to be visually cool. This girl, Quan, which coincidentally is the name of one of my neighbors, loses her dad to an elite major, which makes her the only survivor, and I thought the actress did a fantastic job seeming traumatized by the whole thing. People were saying this was a bad actress, but I just never found that to be the case. If I can though, I'd like to nitpick for a second. I'm not sure if it's Pablo Schraber's body or the costume not fitting him properly, but Master Chief looked really odd. Due to the way the costume for Pablo was designed, he never had that broad shoulder, tall stance look that the games give Chief. His neck in the show looked really long, his arms looked kind of short. And sometimes he had this weird slouch, and with the long neck and the small head, it just made him look like Spoderman. The reason I'm focusing on the Chief specifically is that the rest of his Spartan team look fantastic. The armor fits the actor and actresses perfectly. It's just Pablo's Chief costume that doesn't look quite right. So, Chief and the Spartan team find the dig site that the Covenant were protecting, and inside they find a Forerunner artifact. In the world of the show, humanity doesn't know what the Forerunners are yet, so they're baffled by this new technology that's not Covenant. Chief touches it, and it responds to his human DNA, just like in the games. It overloads his bodily functions, and he gets a brief flash of his childhood that's being suppressed by all the drugs and augmentations. A lone elite witnesses this, and then it flees from the dig site. They then show this pretty cool scene on the Covenant Holy City of High Charity, which by the way looks really awesome in the show. The Prophet of Mercy learns what transpired on the planet from the elite survivor, and he then discusses what happened with a human girl. There's been a lot of anger about this since in the games, the Covenant have their heads so firmly up their own asses that they don't even allow themselves to consider humanity as anything but a walking sin to their religious beliefs. I get that, I get the anger, but I was willing to give this alternate Covenant a shot, and thankfully, in the world of the show, this is also treated as abnormal for the Covenant. So, Forerunner artifacts only only respond to human DNA, which is a problem for the Covenant. So they found this girl and groomed her from a young age to be a kind of antichrist-like figure to help bring about the end of humanity and let them work with Forerunner technology. I also like the Covenant Prophet of Mercy, and I felt he was handled pretty well. He clearly is a religious leader who is firm in his belief that the Covenant are correct, but a small part of him is curious about humanity. For anyone watching who practices a popular religion like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, etc, etc, you know that the temptation of sin always hangs over our shoulders. It's interesting in this show seeing the Holy Prophet of the Covenant, a religious leader, ask a human girl, very briefly, if she'd maybe, someday, perhaps, just a little. Tell him some human stories even though it's a sin. <clears throat> Who said that? Who said that? Uh, not me. Uh, Alien Sunday School is starting. I best pee off. This is a cool way to explore the prophet's hypocrisy, and I hope the show dives deep into this stuff. So, anyways, Quan wakes up on a pelican with Chief that's inbound to Planet Reach. Miranda Keys calls via Skype and tries to convince Quan to tell other outer colonies about the Covenant attacks, and Quan rightfully gets pissed off about them trying to capitalize on the death of all her friends and loved ones. Because the girl won't cooperate, the UNSC orders the chief to execute her. At this time, they're getting a bit freaked out because the artifact messed with his biology and the Spartan brainwashing is starting to wear off, and he's developing a sense of agency. It's now when Chief decides to choose heroism over orders and refuses to kill her. He removes his helmet and shows her that he's not not a faceless robot, but a human like her. When it comes to the games, I don't want Chief just casually removing his helmet, chatting up a storm during gameplay, and generally being out of sync with my gameplay desires as a player, but in the context of the show, I think Pablo Schraber is a solid new take on the Master Chief. It's a different version of the character, but due to Chief being so different in the show, I don't mind things like him removing his helmet. Now, if I were showrunner, I would have made it a mandate that the helmet stays on, because it does work in shows like The Mandalorian or even Dread 3D. But Chief without his helmet isn't going to ruin the show for me. I felt it was earned. The Pelican crash lands in the hangar on Reach where a small army has been assembled to take the Chief down if he doesn't comply. And I love that the Spartans are so dangerous that it takes this many troops for the UNSC to just simply feel comfortable. Chief needs to escape, and he touches that artifact again. And like in Halo 4, the Forerunner artifact screws with the equipment and electronics at the base, 
powering up the chief's pelican, and this allows him and Quan to escape to the stars. And that was it. All in all, I thought it was a pretty fun first episode for the show. The next episode was a bit different, however. I watched it again with the ever-lovely Rebecca, and her commentary was the best part of the episode. After the action-packed first one, things slowed way down, and episode 2 was a bit of a world-building and character-study-focused affair. It begins with a flashback of young Chief and a fellow Spartan trying to escape from the Spartan program, which looks a bit like a prison camp. Chief isn't able to leave, and his friend is forced to leave him behind. The reason the Chief is thinking about his old friend is because he's going to visit him on this outlaw-run, Star Wars-style asteroid city. Chief hasn't seen him since that night, and after what the artifact did, he's starting to think about himself more critically. There's a brief cutaway to Halsey on Reach, where she and Lord Hood discuss the Chief's escape. Hood is worried about Chief's agency, and Silver Team gears up to chase after him. After a brief Star Wars-y action sequence of the Pelican nearly crashing into asteroids, Chief arrives on Asteroid City as what I can only describe as Mass Effect star map music begins to swell. It's around this time when the music started to actually distract Rebecca and I. Two episodes in, and the Halo show seems deathly afraid of using Halo music. Don't get me wrong, they will briefly use the monk chant every now and then, but they'll make sure not to have any Gregorian or monastic undertones and scrub away a lot of the religious reverence that that theme had. It's a very sanitized version of the Halo theme that I don't think is that Great. They get off their pelican, and Pablo and Quan walk through Space Home Depot together, looking for his friend. The people of the city are naturally scared of Chief, because that might mean that the UNSC found them, but instead of reacting in a more panicked and terrified manner, they sort of pick on Chief like a bully? One guy even parks his forklift in front of Chief, and they all begin laughing like a bunch of schoolyard douchebags. What I'm assuming is supposed to be happening is it's like Chief has been walled off from where he's trying to go as a form of intimidation. But this is a small forklift with plenty of room for Chief to just squeeze around it. Pablo instead simply moves the forklift out of the way and they stop their evil laughing and look horrified while the music tries its hardest to make the scene seem tense and I don't know, it's just so weirdly executed. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to do that generic you're not welcome here, stranger scene that we see in countless movies and games, but how this scene specifically executed that intimidation intimidating locals sequence is just have them park a small fridge in front of him and then laugh evilly. Ha ha! This will inconvenience him so much! I bet he's so anxious now! It's just so cheap and weird. Couldn't there have been a better way to have this city intimidate the chief? Shutting doors on him as he asks for information, maybe trying to drop a crate on him while he's walking only for him to catch the crate and throw it against the wall as a sign of strength and anger. Either way, after this, chief's buddy does the Lando Calrissian thing and welcomes chief with open arms, telling all the locals to back off. They load up into a train car as the show then decides to play some Stranger Things music, instead of, you know, Halo music, and they then make their way through a genuinely beautiful looking sci-fi world. Look, for all the goofiness of episode 1's rubbery Master Chief, this show absolutely slaps when it comes to its vistas. Some of these worlds and locations look beautiful and fully realized. It's a cool idea for a city to scrap together a transportation system full of cargo transports, pulleys, and construction equipment since they're not exactly benefiting from tax-funded public transportation systems that a government city might have. They're living on their own out here, and they're making it work. The actual screenplay and dialogue for the Halo TV show can be pretty average to mediocre at times, but the actual thought put into these locations is really impressive and commendable. The world at least feels fully realized. I do need to mention, though, that while they're flying through the asteroid city, they begin using that Mass Effect star map theme again, and it's just... Come on, guys. You got the Halo IP. You don't need to use songs from the game, but the musical language of Halo exists. You can make new songs in that style. What's with all the generic sci-fi stuff? 
We shift over to High Charity again, where that elite survivor informs the prophets and human girl of what he witnessed the chief do. He tells them that he saw a holographic display of Halo. The prophets become overjoyed at the news. What chief found is an artifact they refer to as a keystone, and the human girl instantly offers to infiltrate the human race and get the keystone for the prophets. They're hesitant, but ultimately agree to allow her to do it. Again, the Covenant stuff so far is the highlight of the show for me. Mercy seems to have taken on the role of Truth in this new Halo universe. His design even looks more like Truth than it does Mercy from the games. I'm assuming that the showrunners felt the name Mercy was a bit poetic since in the entire history of the Covenant, he showed Mercy to a single human baby and raised her to be an instrument for the Covenant. And I want to talk about the CGI for a second. The prophets look brilliant. And the complexity in Mercy's facial expressions whenever he looks at this girl is really cool. There's flashes of religious pride, stubborn narcissism, and even, every now and then, an almost parental love for his little antichrist he's been grooming since she was a baby. I think Mercy is a deeply sinful individual in the Covenant. He's curious about things beyond his religion, and having this human girl by his side under the excuse of her being necessary so the Covenant can get access to Forerunner technology is cool. I mentioned years ago about how stories of faith are interesting to me, especially ones that really analyze sin and hypocrisy within a religion due to my Orthodox Christian upbringing. I'm keen to see more of this mercy-slash-truth hybrid in the show. It's interesting stuff. Unfortunately, we're pulled away from the Covenant and have a roundtable sit-down with Lord Hood, Halsey, the head of Oni, and other UNSC personnel, where Halsey reveals the key to obtaining the Chief. She's developing an AI program named Cortana, which will override his brain if he ever fails to listen to orders. Halsey calls Cortana the next stage in human evolution. This annoyed the hell out of Rebecca and I, to be honest. As open as I am to new stuff, this took quite a few minutes for me to digest and process before moving on. They even show this bald clone of Halsey in a tank while she monologues about how Cortana will upgrade humanity and make Spartans even more lethal. I don't know, man, this is a really odd way to do Cortana, but we'll see where it goes. Chief meets his friend's family, which are Cruella and child. This is unfortunately where the episode really <laughs> began to lose Rebecca, but man, I tried hanging on for dear life. I was forcing myself to let this show do its own thing, even if we are veering a bit more towards Star Wars than I'm comfortable with Halo getting. Chief's friend tells him that he's gotta unplug from the chemicals and microchips in his body that suppress his emotions so that he can enjoy the finer things in life. And then he smokes some space weed, <laughs> which was even funnier. I should also mention mentioned that by now Chief has been helmetless for most of the show, and the differences between Pablo's Chief and Xbox's Chief are becoming bigger and bigger. It's ultimately up to you if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but Rebecca and I really like Pablo. Minus his goofy Spoderman armor, we actually really like this interpretation of the Chief, but I'm not going to argue with those who really don't like it, because it is quite different. Chief's friend then takes him and Quan to a prison, where they meet a guy who might be able to help with figuring out what this artifact is. It's a bit goofy, to be honest, just because of the silly prison setting and the over-the-top acting from the inmates, but he reveals to Chief that only certain humans are able to interact with Forerunner objects in this universe. Covenant refer to these beings as blessed blessed ones, but they're very rare among humans. Chief has another interaction with the object that lets him see more of his childhood, but also his abduction. The crazy guy then begins freaking out and does the whole you don't know what you are, do you, vague cryptic nonsense alongside the you saw it, the darkness, which I guess means that Chief is being set up to be some sort of special character from birth. Chief then hilariously screams, what am I? And then the guy starts screaming and it just gets really silly and Star Wars like, I don't know, it's just, this whole scene rubbed me the wrong way. It didn't really seem like Halo, you know? That's such a vague and frustrating thing to say, but for fans of the game, you understand what I'm talking about. And for those who aren't fans of the game, I'm sure you look at scenes like this and you're just like, this kind of feels like discount Star Wars, what the hell is this? The only thing that saved the scene for me is the music finally begins using strings to create an ominous rendition of the Halo Monk chant. It's a great rendition, and unfortunately it's brief because then we get right back to that generic sci-fi stuff. Chief panics, 
packs up the artifact and leaves Quan on Asteroid City so he can return to UNSC space. This is bigger than anyone realizes, and he needs UNSC help. The Covenant can't find Halo, because if they do, it's extinction for the human race. He allows himself to be captured, and Halsey tries to ask Chief what his line of reasoning was for defying orders. There's some really awkward nudity, then, as the Covenant human girl changes out of her pepper shaker costume into human clothes, while Chief just rambles on and on about being different, not being able to trust anyone, and anything else that I think might sound good in a trailer as generic sci-fi music plays. Halsey then says, this is a new beginning, as the bald Halsey clone is woken up, and that's a wrap on the episode. It was weird, to say the least. For better or for worse, it is a new universe within the Halo IP. There's a lot of ideas that I really like, such as exploring the hypocrisy of the Covenant religion through the relationship Mercy has with this adoptive human daughter-like figure. But then there's some stuff that I'm less keen on, like the Master Chief being a savior, chosen one type of figure who jams out to Stranger Things music while Halsey plans for blue glowing ladies in wigs to take over Spartan brains. I really enjoy the first episode, but episode two was a bit of a drag for me and Rebecca. Not every episode has to be advancing the universal plot in any meaningful way. Sometimes slow burn, character focused episodes are just what a show needs, but I think it was a bit of a mistake to hit the brakes and slow down in only the second episode. Exploring the characters, their drama and beef with each other in the greater state of the galaxy is something I would have saved for when Chief did return to UNSC space. You could have a whole slow, character focused episode while he's in chains being interrogated. Despite episode two being a bit of a snore, I am curious to see where the show goes. There's some stuff I'm very keen on, but there's also stuff I'm not. Now, I'm not an expert in movie or show production, but I will have you know that I made plenty of home movies in my backyard when I was nine, so I think that qualifies me to review the production of those way more talented than myself. I give The Halo Show, so far, a C+. It clearly has an idea for how it wants to bring the Halo universe to life. It works, it's not a complete disaster, but it's not very ambitious in how it brings those ideas out. It plays it very safe, and if it wanted to, it could improve dramatically. So, my teacher's notes for the show would be as follows. Punch up the dialogue. It doesn't need to be something like a Quentin Tarantino flick in terms of organic person-to-person -person dialogue, but there is a lot of just very generic chit-chat in the show, with such bangers that you've heard in other properties, movies, shows, and games such as, What am I? You don't know what you are. And one of my personal favorite cliched lines, I can't wait to get off this stupid rock, just before the character is whisked off planet by the plot. The dialogue of the show needs more enthusiasm, more humanity to it. It's being very safe, and it's very scared to be anything other than serviceable. My second note for the show would be to just inject a bit more Halo musical DNA into the score. This is no shade at Sean Callery, he's a brilliant musician, but the original Halo trilogy is famous for its music. People who don't even play Halo listen to Halo music. Like Star Wars, the musical language of the Halo trilogy is a part of the franchise's core identity, and while the trilogy's music left a legacy that's still remembered to this day, the Halo show's music will be forgotten minutes after watching. Like the dialogue, it's just very unambitious music, and it lacks personality. Now, the goal of a show's soundtrack is to not steal the spotlight from the scenes going on, but surely it can be a little bit more remarkable than this. Get some tribalistic drums in there. Get some more Celtic-style adventurous string arrangements. Get some piano. Get some choir and moody synths. Be proud of the IP's musical power, not scared of it. This is Halo, for Christ's sake. And my final note would be cleaning up the production a bit. Episode 2 was a step up in polish over Episode 1, but moments like the unpainted plasma pistol prop, right in frame, Pablo Schreiber's Spoderman chief armor, the CGI gun sliding on the floor, and so on, is all stuff that's dangerous in the age of internet memes. There are those who want the show to fail, and this lack of polish gives those trolls ammunition. A majority of people won't notice stuff like this, but for those who do, all they need is one screenshot and then they'll never let the show hear the end of it. And it's not a good look when the show's social media is flooded with memes of production errors or moments that needed more touching up. Those are my thoughts on the show. 
What did you think of it? I'm liking it so far, minus the rough second episode. There's enough fan service to keep my belly full, and it's been a lot of fun watching with Rebecca every week. I'm going to be reading the comments down below, so hopefully there's some interesting discussions going on. Keep it civil, keep it safe, and I'll see you guys on the next video.